So I, I love these last two presentations um, about communication with animals. Um, and my work is all about the communication with a human animal, between human animals. And I'm really focused on bringing greater consciousness to listening and speaking we practice in everyday life um, with the goal of working towards greater peace, justice, and equality in our society. I was trained as a sculptor, and for the past eight years, I've been exploring the physical, political, and psychological form of listening, the act of listening. In 2012, I began researching the history of communication technology and I became enamored with listening devices of the late 19th and early 20th centuries. And you can see one of them right there on the left. Um, so on the left is a spying device uh, that was used by militaries all over the world. This one in particular was used by the UK during World War I. And it's really hard to imagine, but this was like the height of listening technology at the time. Um, this was before radar was invented. Um, and these sorts of machines were in use up until like 1939 when there were radar stations that were um, imposed all around the UK and, and elsewhere. Um, and I was really enamored with this object as I mentioned and I wanted to recreate it and this was also um, it, at a time, um, I'm not, yeah, um, this was also right around the time where Edward Snowden was um, leaking all of his information to WikiLeaks, and um, there were all these whistleblowers, and um, and so our idea of spying, um, what the NSA was doing, what our government was listening to, um, was really present, um, and uh, and I and I also wanted to see. So I was thinking about those ideas of spying and listening, like the nefarious aspect of listening, of the state listening to us. Um, but I was also um, really interested in what these sounded like. Um, <laughs> and so, um, so I actually found, I scavenged these horns. They were um, originally used in the Rose Bowl Parade to project yeah. sound. Um, and that's what's so interesting about these kinds of plastic sonic technology is that they can both be used to project sound and to receive and amplify sound. Um, so they really mirror human communication in that way. Um, and, uh, and sure enough, this sculpture that I built um, based off of this design really picked up those low frequency sounds really well. So the, the drones of planes um, that the, the uh, the device on the left was built to pick up. I actually traveled with this to a few different locations, um, and they all had different purposes and uses, and um, not, I was interested in also not just talking about like the nefarious part of listening, but also like the positive part of listening too. Um, you know, active listening is really a vital part of our democracy, um, and it's what what makes our society run and work, um, and a healthy democracy. And it's also obviously an important component of human communication and connection. Uh, so I was invited to install this on Pomona College's campus and do a project with students. Um, and what I decided to do was to do a bunch of listening workshops with, with students. So besides being an artist, I also have done a lot of research and training in different kinds of listening technologies, so I've um, done a training in nonviolent communication in a form of group dialogue called council, which is like an emotional based um, kind of dialogue, which is used a lot in prisons and in schools. Um, and also I've done community organizing training too. And so I wanted to bring all of those knowledges and all of those methods and strategies and technologies to the students that I was working with um, I also taught um, for nine years, and, um, and as an educator, I think it's really important to, to encourage students to be informed citizens, but also to be compassionate beings. I know compassion was a word that had come up in among the other talks. Um, so that's what the workshops focused on. Um, so after, creating, after years of creating projects around listening, um, I really started getting interested in um, conscious speaking and conscientious speaking. 
And um, I started, I was invited to create this mural on the wall of Beck Art Gallery. Um, it's in Culver City and it's the corner of La Cienega in Venice. And it used to be an old smog shop, so it's this really um, very high traffic corner. Um, and uh, I started working on this at the beginning of the Black Lives Matter movement um, and, and was working on it during the standoff in, in Standing Rock with the water protectors. Um, and so those things were sort of resonating, those movements were resonating as I was working on this. Um, and the mural features my friend and artist Derek Maddox, um, who was with one of my sculptures. And I took a photo of him um, with the sculpture. Um, I actually met Derek during this series of conversations that I organized. So I make art, I make sculpture, but I also um, curate dialogues um, within different communities, um, within the art world and outside of the art world, um, as part of my uh, work to um, foster communication. And so um, this, the project that I met Derek in was called um, Race, Art, and Survival. And it was, uh, we partnered, Robbie Herbst was my co-curator, and we partnered with a group of young artists of color called Michelada Think Tank. And they were developing um, a people of color guide to the art world. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, they were really focused on survival strategies for artists of color um, in an art world that is predominantly white. And so there was a series of conversations at LACE, Los Angeles um, uh, Contemporary Art, um, exhibits, um, and uh, and and then um, then they came out with their guide, their POC guide, <laughs> um, and so I met Derek through those conversations, and and later I saw him perform at an activist event where he was raising awareness about police brutality, uh, and he um, did this performance where he did a spoken word piece about an incident where he had been mistaken by the police for, her, for a man who they thought was going to commit suicide. Mm -hmm. But they, instead of like, you know, talking him down or approaching him with, a compass with compassion, um, they basically like started beating him up. Um, and so I was really struck by that story and, and the way that he, he told it. And, um, and that was one of the main inspirations for the mural. The resiliency of the human voice and his human voice. Um, so, uh, so th these are the sculptures um, that, that Derek was holding. Um, the one on the left is called the Hands Up, Don't Shoot Horn, and the one on the right is called the Histophone. Um, they work like m megaphones, um, so they amplify the human voice, but they simultaneously cover the mouth of the speaker. So you have to talk into that little hole in the palm in order for your voice to, to be resonated, to be um, magnified. Uh, it's plastic and lightweight, and it's very easy to transport. Um, it's made with the cast of a human hand and arm that's merged with the bell of a trumpet. Um, and I've been bringing these um, sculptures to marches and protests. Um, I started a marching band called Take a Stand Marching Band. Uh, this is from a May Day parade march that we participated in. And I call it parallel play for those of you that are parents. Um, I'm a parent of a three-year-old, um, and I see him playing alongside another person, another me, for example, he doesn't always play with me. <laughs> Sometimes he's playing by himself, but other kids. Um, and, and I think about this activity as parallel play. Um, for any of you that have been in marches recently, um, in Los Angeles, there's like the Aztec marchers, um, there's the, um, the anarchist drummers. You know, like there's all these things going on beyond just like people holding signs. And I think that that parallel play is just like so important to feeding our spirits and um, our humanity and just like our sense of um, play and imagination within these very highly charged political environments where people are like shouting and, and angry, right, righteously so. Um, so, but, but that these, like, that there can be like these other kinds of spaces that just like bring a humanity to these marches. 
Um, so I'm, I'm also developing other sculptures <laughs> along with um, that uh, horn sculpture. Uh, this sculpture, the Donald Trumpet, was actually, I started it during um, 45's campaign. And um, of course, not knowing what was gonna happen, like I thought this sculpture could either just like be a blip um, or it could totally change its meaning um, depending on who gets elected. Um, so it's the bronze cast of a megaphone, it's 45 pounds, um, and then, then it has a gold-plated anus um, that's plugging the <coughs> megaphone. Um, I just want to say I don't think that there's anything inherently wrong with like the anus as a part of the human body, but definitely like speaking out of one's anus is like universally <laughs> reviled, right? Um, and so we know that 45 does that really well. Um, and, and so I've made this as a silent megaphone, just kind of sits there. Um, I've also um, created a, um, um, a video with my husband who is a graph, like does, he's a graphic designer and, and motion graphics and um, we've envisioned um, the Donald J. Trump Presidential Library where this um, trumpet will eventually be housed, which is underground in an unmarked field in Flint, Michigan. Um, and then like it'll decay over time until like all of the contents will no longer be there, including the sculpture. Um, and so the sculpture series is ongoing. This is the Me and You Kazoo um, with a resin cast and a cast of two fingers. Um, and it functions just like a kazoo. Right now I'm working on um, a rattle with fingers pointing, so as you shake it, it just kind of like shakes it, everybody um, around you. Um, and so, so this band is this like um, um, group of instruments, a series of instruments is, um, I'm hopefully gonna complete it in 2020, um, but, but we'll see. Each one of the instruments takes me about a year to make. Um, and I think that's it. I'm done. <laughs> Thank you.